This is YBR with Beam and G Drive, and today we're going to be taking a look at a mod called the WLD Freight Series 30-2. And if you thought that name was long, good luck saying all of the possible names for this train. There are a lot of options here. I'm not going to drive every single one of these. Instead, I'm going to drive some of the ones that I think have a cool paint job or a unique configuration, and then I'll give you an overview of what parts are available so you can get an idea of what makes up all of these different trains. Now the map we're on right now is a map I've never used in a video before, so you might not recognize it. This map is really good for this train though, because if you go to the map selector, there's a map called Train Racing Mountain. That's the one we're on. And if you look at the thumbnail, that is the train we have in the thumbnail. So this map really is made for this train, it feels like. And one of the real nice conveniences is, when you spawn up the map, there is already a train ready to go. It is pre-aligned with the tracks, so you can drive it immediately if you load up the map with the train installed. On other maps though, they have train tracks that work with the train, but you're going to have to line it up yourself. So I'm going to show you how to do that before we do any driving. First, we need to go ahead and decide on a train. I want to get one that's a different color than the one we have. So how about we get the Burlington Southern and Santa Fe 1A DE. We're going to spawn it right next to the train I have, and ideally, it would just land on the tracks perfectly. But as you see, that is not what happened. And it looks like maybe it's going to go onto the tracks automatically. It's not. It's still crooked and it'll just roll off the tracks if you try to do anything. So we need to line this thing up. First thing we're going to do is we're going to hold shift and hit C to get the camera separate from the vehicle. Then we're going to hit J to freeze physics and then F11 to go into the map editor. Then we're going to look for the little beam and G icon on the train and we're going to select it. We're going to go over here to rotation. If you don't have the rotation menu available, make sure you're in the object editor mode. And then under rotation, we're going to zero this out. So we're just going to put zero, 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 zero. And it might not stay as zero. What that does is it makes the train aligned straight with the map. I know that sounds weird, but every map I've seen with train tracks will have a spot where the train tracks are either running along the map or 90 degrees to that. If it's 90 degrees to that, then you change the number to 90. And I found that is the easiest way to put the train on the tracks. Because if you're trying to put the train on a piece of track that's at an angle, it's a lot more difficult because you got to use the rotation tool and you got to try to rotate it just the right amount and you're going forward and back, left and right. It's really fiddly. This way though, you just say, let me zero this out and it'll line itself up straight with the map. And in this case, it's straight with the tracks right here. Like that was totally a design intent with this map. So then once you have it aligned correct rotation wise, you got to align it the other way. So we're just going to go ahead and go left and right. That looks pretty good. You want to make sure it's as centered as you can go. So that's about as good as it's going to get, I think. And then we're going to put it a little bit in the air. You don't want to put it too high, but you want it to actually drop onto the train tracks. You want it to be just a small gap between the wheels and the train track. There is just enough where you know there's a gap and it should be fine. There we go. The train is now on the tracks and it looks like it's perfectly on the tracks. We look at the front and rear wheels and it's perfect. Now we got two trains and both of them are ready to go. So we hit F11 to go out of the map editor and then we're going to go back to the original train right here so you can see these trains are slightly different but not in significant ways it's just a few parts here and there are changed out so on this one it has a big old horn on the top has a little light on the top this one doesn't have those on the top but it does have this little handle looking piece on the top it right, is actually an antenna i believe but whenever i look at it i just think it's some sort of handle and then the rest of the trains appear to be pretty much the same all the other parts on the top are as far as i can tell identical so let's go ahead and drive this thing, and it's actually pretty easy to drive it. All you do is you put the gearbox into realistic mode, you shift into manual one, and then you hit the accelerator and it'll accelerate. You can also slow down by simply hitting the brakes that you would normally use, and that will bring the train to a stop. You also have the option to brake in a different manner as well at higher speeds. So let me go ahead and get this thing up to about 50 miles per hour or so. Up to 40, we're going to be at 50 any moment now and 50 so when you're at higher speeds you can shift into manual two this enables the dynamic braking mode which works until you hit about 15 to 20 miles per hour and then at that point it stops doing anything and you need to rely on the regular brakes or even the parking brake button to make it come to a complete stop so we can go ahead and just hit the parking brake and you see we are now at a complete stop and i want to race these two trains so i'm going to reset this and we're going to do the exact same procedure we always use. So we're going to go ahead and freeze physics, put this thing into manual one, and then hold the accelerator, go to the other train, 
make sure it is in realistic mode and put it to manual one and then they both should take off at exactly the same time. Perfect. The race is on. And honestly, they should drive at basically the exact same speed for quite some time. But then a corner will come up. And when that corner comes up, I expect there to be some chaos because this train cannot hold on if you're going 80 miles per hour around a hard corner, which is what I plan to do, or at least close to 80 miles per hour. I don't know how fast we'll be going, but I do know you can derail these trains. I've done it before in practice. And I wasn't even trying to derail it back then. Now I'm actually trying to derail it. It's pretty cool seeing them go at basically the exact same rate of speed though. It's neat. Two nice looking trains cruising along at 70 miles per hour. Oh wait, hey, I just noticed one small visual difference between these two I didn't mention earlier. This one has the horns up there in the back and the other one just doesn't have any horns back there, I think. But a lot of small pieces like that that you uh, might not notice on the trains unless you look real closely like I just did. Oh, maybe the lights on the rear are different? Slightly different color, yeah. Lots of small little details. Again, I'll be going over all the different part options later on, but right now, I am preparing myself for the derailment and the crash, which should happen here, maybe. I thought this corner would be tight enough, maybe not. Oh, uh, we got the inside light on this one. We're going faster now, which means he'd probably tip first because his corner is a little bit tighter, right? Unfortunately, ain't nobody tipping yet. It has to happen eventually because look how crazy this place gets. <laughs> this place looks like a roller coaster, doesn't it? These are train tracks, but you look at it, it don't look like no train track. All right, here we go. Here's where the corner tightens. Somebody's going to tip here. You got to tip. At least my experience tells me something's got to tip. There we go. They are tipping. Let's get that slow-mo going. <laughs> look at them go. They're both tipping at the same time. That looks so ridiculous. All right, here we go. Eight top slow-mo. And <laughs> here go the trains. Like, it's one of those things where usually if a train derails, it's terrible. But I can laugh about it here. That's unusual. Oh, that one's going to hit right into that sign. Oh, he's going to go straight through the sign. The sign is not a solid object. All right, well, uh, this is actually... Oh, what did you just hit? I don't know what it just hit. It kind of just dug into the ground. This guy, he's just on the other train tracks now. <laughs> he just the tracks, and he's totally fine. There we go. We have now derailed two trains. And really, the only way to get the trains back onto the track is using the fancy reset by hitting insert, where you just go like this. That's the only way to reliably get them back onto the tracks. Otherwise, they're not going to be on the tracks. You also want to make sure that you don't respawn it where the tracks curve. Like right here, there's a little bit of a curve to the tracks. And if you look closely, the left wheels aren't centered properly. So if you try to accelerate here, I don't expect it to work too well. Yeah, like there's all kinds of smoke going up and stuff. That's not right. You want to reset it a little bit farther back to about there. And at this point, the track is perfectly straight. We try to accelerate here and we shouldn't see any of those uh, smoke greens. There'll still be sparks because it's metal on metal, but there shouldn't be the smoke. There we go. That's exactly what it should look like. So that train is running fine. We'll go ahead and reset it and then let's take a look at this train that actually got some damage to it. So it actually got bent a little bit, which is mighty impressive because trains are very, very heavy. So anyways, that's what it looks like when it crashes, but I think it's more interesting what it looks like when you take some parts off of it. I want as many pieces as possible flying all over the place in the most dramatic way possible. I think the best way to do that is first we turn on zero gravity and then we hit the brake button, which breaks everything that possibly can come off the train. And you'll see just how many pieces actually make up this thing. So first off, all the railing on the side, yeah, that's gone. And then we have a couple of small pieces on the side. Those are flying off as well. The nose piece is flying off. The door is flying off. And then all these pieces on the top, those are all separate pieces that are all flying off on their own speed. All these little panels on the side, those are all separate doors that can all fly off on their own. That's another door. And then the whole underside of the train is going to detach from the upper side as well. So there's just tons of pieces all over the place that are detaching. Maybe a little handle right there, or maybe a piece of a ladder. I don't know what it is, but there's a piece there. Just pieces all over the place. And one of the neat things is, when you actually take some of these pieces off, what's under it all? Kind of hard to do it as the train flies up into the air, but there is a really nice engine under there, which I think might be easier to take a look at when the train's back on the ground. But you can see how everything on the bottom of the train is now separated from the upper half. Just pieces coming off everywhere. So many pieces to make up this thing. And now we got to get it back onto the ground. So again, Dramatic way, earth gravity engaged, and we're gonna do a little twirl because that's what the camera wants to do and bend the train. All right, get back onto the track and same goes for your buddy over there. They should be ready to go now. So we're gonna do pretty much the same thing, but without zero gravity. So we'll go to fun stuff, hit brake, and then let's try to remove as much as we can from the engine. 
I'll start by removing uh, just about everything, actually. It's all sticking together. This might work really well. Oh, that is perfect. That makes it really easy to see the engine. And with a mod like this, I totally expected it to be hollow. I did not expect there to be a fully modeled engine inside of it. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I wanted to make sure you guys got a good look at it too, because this is an engine that is bigger than a car. A lot bigger than a car. It is huge and it makes huge amounts of power. I'll show you how much power it makes later on, but not yet. Now I want to take a look at the inside of the train. So let's go ahead and go to the inside here. And then we have this little control panel here, which has all these functional levers and gauges. Before we take a look at that, how about a look at the rest of the area here? So we got a lot of warnings. Apparently it's 600 volts and is dangerous, so we shouldn't do too much with that. Over here we have another seat for like your co-driver and then a fire extinguisher, which I don't know how much it'll do on a train this big. And like if that thing catches on fire, I'm just like, I'm out of here. I'm done. Anyways, over here on the gauges and levers, you'll see I'm going to put this thing into manual one and one of the levers will move. We are now in gear. The lever right there, that is the throttle. So as we increase and decrease throttle, the lever moves back and forth. When we go into a dynamic braking mode, like uh, so, you see that lever moves to dynamic braking mode. Then when we're done, we can downshift again to go back into just manual one. When we hit the regular brakes, we got the red lever over there that moves back and forth. And yes, it does move depending on how hard you hit it. So let's go ahead and accelerate some more. And you can see miles per hour, that's working fine. And we could basically do a train simulator game in BeamNG Drive. Like this really does feel kind of like a train simulator. It's not as in depth as one of those obviously, but it's good enough for me to just kind of have fun cruising around in a train. Although I'm going dangerously fast. It does say maximum speed is 65 miles per hour. I did exceed that. We're gonna exceed it again though, knowing me. Intentionally, unintentionally, it doesn't matter. All you need to know is we will exceed that speed somehow, some way. I think it'd actually be really cool to see what it looks like when you tip the train from the inside. So let's go ahead and try to get up to speed to do that. That corner looks pretty tight and promising. We're going a little bit over the maximum speed. So we are very highly likely to tip over on this corner. Here we go. Come on. Oh yeah, we're tipping. We have tipped. Ah, oh, we didn't fall off the edge. I thought for sure we might fall off the edge. If we did this again with the other train, it would. Ooh, co-driver, you okay? I don't know what they actually call them, but man, you okay over there? Let's see if we can see anything from the outside. From the outside, it actually doesn't look that bad. It's kind of hard to see it though, because it's up against the ground. We can try to take a peek through the ground, see how far we can zoom out. Not that far. So overall, doesn't look that damaged, but it's hard to know. I mean, the engine still works perfectly fine, which to me is the important part, I guess. So here's an idea though. What if we hit that train with another train? I don't know what will happen here because I've never tried this before. In fact, I've actually done very little crash testing with the trains. I was mostly just trying them out to see kind of how to control them and stuff and then just admiring all the different paint jobs. But we are moving perfectly fine. I'm going to actually intentionally cruise for a little bit, just kind of coast through here to make sure I don't go too fast. I do notice there is some smoke coming up, but as far as I know, the wheels on this thing should be aligned correctly. I guess it's just because it's leaning maybe a little bit because I'm going so fast. But you can tell this thing doesn't want to go much faster than that around the corner. Now straightened up though, so we'll go ahead and floor it. We got to make sure we slow down on that corner though, because obviously that corner is steep enough to make the train tip over. We're not going above the maximum speed yet, so we can keep on flooring it though, as far as I'm concerned. And by the way, I should also mention, yes, you can attach these two together. Yes, we will be trying that later on. Oh, slow down, slow down. Use the regular brakes for a bit. All right. That seems like it'd probably be a fine speed to go through here. It's like 40 miles per hour. All right, here we go. What's going to happen? I, I don't know. Let's find out. Eight times slow-mo. Oh, get out of the wall. It's obliterating it. Oh, no, it's not. It obliterated it through like the hollow section where the uh, driver would be. And then it got to the big fat engine and it said, no, I'm done with you. You can't go any more past that. Well, there goes a couple of pieces. It almost looks like a a quadcopter or something going off the edge like right here, doesn't it? Like that looks like it could be like some kind of homemade quadcopter. All right, can we uh, back out of this? By the way, the way to back out, you go to high range, which is the reverse gear on this thing because trains are funny like that. When you try to implement trains into a game that's mostly designed for cars, they're gonna have some weird solutions just like that. And it seems like we're not gonna separate these two. So I'm gonna try this again. And hopefully this time we can do even more damage to it, but I'm really not sure. It seems like we were able to get through the soft front part 
But once we got to the engine block, that thing is a big hunk of metal that's basically indestructible as far as I'm concerned. So I don't know if this will actually do anything more, if it'll just kind of bounce off of it or what. Right now, my main focus is just don't go so fast to tip. And this is kind of a cool camera angle actually right here. It's cinematic, but also easy to control at the same time. A lot of the time you have like a cinematic camera angle, you can't really drive it easily. But here, yeah, no problem driving it. And it looks pretty cool, doesn't it? All dramatic and stuff. All right, so we're gonna floor it for the rest of the way until we get to the next corner. And then we gotta slow down just a bit to probably about 40 to 50, I think, to make sure we don't accidentally fall off the edge. Although, you know what? We do want to fall off the edge, I think, at least once, to watch this thing fly in the air and crash into the ground. That'll probably be pretty interesting to see, I'm thinking. But we are approaching the previously crashed train, 45 miles per hour, it's a good speed. We can floor it for the rest of the way, probably. I don't know, it seems like it's tipping a little bit, like leaning, so I'm scared to floor it. All right, here we go, impact. Three, two, one, boom. Ah, it was doing something, then it just hits that engine block, and it is so big and heavy, can't do it. It can't do anything. Although maybe it bent it a little bit. Not a lot, that's for sure. I think just a tiny bit more bent. So here's what we're gonna do. We don't need to go to the very bottom to get enough speed, it turns out. I thought maybe we would, that's why I reset it back there. Uh, we can go like halfway and get enough speed, I think, to fall off the edge right there. So bring it back to about here. And it's a nice flat area. Hopefully it lined up straight with the tracks. Looks good to me, so we just go ahead and floor it all the way. We're not gonna let up at all. And hopefully we have a cool looking crash, like maybe we'll hit a tree on the way down. Maybe something unexpected. If we just fall off and smash into it, it's not quite as fun as if we have an impact with something, at least that's what I think. Yeah, we're up to 50 miles per hour already. We did not need to go all the way down the hill. I just, for some reason I thought that would be necessary, but the train is surprisingly fast on the hills. All right, here we go. 67 miles per hour, we're tipping. We are gone and flying. Let's see what happens here. All right, we got all these trees around us. Are we gonna hit any of them? Uh, Yeah, we're hitting that one right now. We are crashing into it. Is anything gonna happen? All right, there we go. Something's happening. We have bent the front half of the train a bit. The rear half is falling apart. That is a great success. The main engine is broken though, so this thing is not gonna be able to drive. You got a good look at the engine there. Lots of the parts falling off. I like that, and you can really see how sturdy the train is. Even falling off of the road, flying into some trees, it only bends just a little bit. Camera does not want to look straight above this thing for some reason. There you go, now that's the ideal camera angle, so you kind of see the engine and how it's all flopped open. Yeah, pretty good crash overall though, so I'm gonna go ahead and do something different now. I'm gonna bring these back to where we started. Now I want to do that for both of them. And the first one actually ended up on the side of the track, so I'm gonna have to fix that real quickly and I'll be back once it's done. Alrighty, the trains are set up. And what I wanna do now is I wanna attach the two trains together. But how are we gonna do that when they're on separate tracks? Well, I got good news for you. There is a solution directly behind us. So we have two switches right here and you might've noticed when I was going through the vehicles earlier that sometimes it would appear on this or this. Those are the switches. So what you do is you hit left and right and you can control the direction the switch points. So we point it to the right, and then we hit tab so it stays pointed in that direction. And then if we back up with this train, it should switch to the other set of tracks. And from my testing, it seems like you can hit these at pretty good speed. So I'm gonna try to hit this about 30 miles per hour and see if it works or not. Sometimes it does get derailed, but it doesn't seem like it's really related to how fast you go. It's just sometimes it happens. So like right there, he went through it at 30 miles per hour with no problem, so that's great. Now we're gonna go ahead and accelerate forward to the other train. And just for fun, I'm gonna do my very, very best to slam on the brakes and stop without hitting that train as close as I can. So we're gonna slam on the brakes right now. Oh, I did it too late. I did it too late, didn't I? Let's see, is it gonna stop in time? Oh, it stopped, really? That is, like that is impressive how fast a train can stop without any cargo being pulled. That's just like stopping so good. I now want to attach these two, and I think it might not work from this train. Yeah, it's not working from this train. We have to be in the other train to attach the two. And it's like, well, what's the difference? It has to do with which couplers are on which train. So this one has like an A in the front and the B in the rear. And whichever one you have, you have to click it where you want to connect the B to the A. We're trying to connect the A to the B. If you don't understand it, just all you have to know is when you go into the menu here, 
And then you look at the couplers, you have to have a different one on each train. So you have a front A, front B. So you can connect the fronts to the rears on any train that has that setup. But to do that, you have to be the train in front, basically. So let's see, does that work? Yeah, that's not working either. I thought that was a problem. Maybe it's just it needs a little help because they're so big and heavy. Are you connecting? Okay, there we go. It's just they're really big and heavy, so you gotta do a little bit of manual help. So now we have two trains that are connected together. Let's try moving with them. We're gonna accelerate with both of them. We've gotta take the parking brake off of that one. So now both trains should be accelerating and we're not gonna go any faster than we were before with this setup, actually. It would just give you more power if you were towing a lot of cargo. But I thought it'd be fun to attach them up and then make them derail. We're gonna be a little bit before we get there, so we gotta find something to do. First, I'll just let you guys see kind of what it looks like when you have two trains attached together like that. It works great. The coupling system works fine for trains or cars. It's actually quite surprising. I did not expect that. And uh, let me give you another look. This is what it looks like from the inside when you're connected to a train in front of you. I thought that was kind of cool that from here, you can see that train right there. And of course, all the gauges and stuff which I kind of got distracted by, but that's just neat. And I bet if we were in the train in front of us, we could also see the train behind me. Oh, I gotta turn my head, I think, the other way. Hold on. There we go, yeah, I could just barely make out the corner of them, and I probably could even wave to the dude back there if I could actually see him. <laughs> That's fun. And we should be coming up to the derailment center any moment now. I know it's a little bit later on the corner, but it's soon. I should do a little bit of slow-mo when I expect it to happen. That's what I should do. I don't think it's yet, though, because I don't see any sort of tippage. Not yet. Yeah, it's going to take a second. It's like right when you start to see the signs telling you to slow down because there's a corner. Like right here, it should happen really, really soon. So here, put a little bit of slow-mo on. And then let's see. Do I see it tipping at all? Yeah, it looks pretty sturdy so far. No tipping yet. Oh, there it goes. It's tipping. It is tipping. We're going to get the slow-mo on now. We got eight times slow-mo. Might be overkill, honestly, with the trains. They don't do anything super dramatic in the crashes that require the slow-mo, but I'm so used to hitting slow-mo, I do it anyways. Yeah, just had a couple pieces falling off. Mostly what they do is they just slowly tip over and then they scrape along the ground. And probably what's happening is the side that's getting scraped is getting damaged, but you really can't see that, can you? Anyways, that's a derailment. Now I'm going to reset this and we're going to take a look at a different train. I want to take a look at a train that's a lot faster than the one we have. So remember I was telling you about the engine, these things are crazy. So a regular one of these has 22,000 foot-pounds of torque and nearly 3,000 horsepower. And that's the norm. Like, you click any of these, that's the stats it has. But then when you get to the very bottom, you have a race edition? Yeah, you have a race edition. And the numbers on that are just staggering. Like, 22,000 foot-pounds of torque is just absurd, okay? And then this one, it adds another digit to that. It has 669,000 foot-pounds of torque and over 100,000 horsepower. Like, if you have a car with 1,000 horsepower, you're going to be faster than everybody you meet, basically. This has 100,000 horsepower. It is a racing train. Like, how absurd can something be? Also, it has a racing wing on it. Yeah, it has a wing on a train. That's how you know it's a racing train that's super fast. And it's got big turbos, like that turbo. Let me put a car next to that turbo so you can actually get how big it is, okay? Those turbos are huge. At least, you know, compared to the turbos you have on a car. Compared to the turbos on a train, they're probably not that much bigger, I would think. But look, here we go. So there's a car, right? That turbo is about the size of the car's engine. And it has two of them. They are massive. So anyways, get rid of that car. And then let's try driving the super train. And with this train, it actually has a normal gearbox. So you can go into first gear and start to drive it. But the one thing I notice is it immediately just revs like that and it doesn't move. What's happening is it just has so much power that the clutch is just slipping completely, I guess. So the way it works is you accelerate, once it starts doing that, you shift. So like shift right there because the clutch is slipping, shift again, shift, shift. You can't see like immediately, it's good and slipping, so you shift. By the way, this thing has nine gears in total. 
and we are going nearly 200 miles per hour in like virtually no time at all. It felt like this thing is crazy fast. And also it has a flamethrower on top. I don't know if you noticed that, but yeah, it's shooting fireballs nonstop. It's just super fast train. That's why. And it's going to tip very, very soon because when you're going this fast, it's very easy to tip. Train is tipping. Let's see if anything interesting happens to it. With this much speed, I expect it to kind of wrap itself around a tree if it can make it to one. I mean, we are moving so fast. We're going to hit one of these trees. These trees are closer than I thought. All right, let's get extra slow-mo now. Because it's going to wrap around a tree, I'm pretty sure. Let's see, is it going to hit that one? Is it going to hit him? Just barely. And it's a tree that sticks out a lot, so it's hard to see. But all you have to know is it's glitching out. It is freaking out right here. It is not made for crashes at these speeds, obviously. But we tried it anyways. Go a little bit faster. Go to 16 times slow-mo again. And pieces are just flying everywhere. I can't even identify some of the parts anymore. There's so many pieces going all over the place. And this train has been ruined. But man, it moved fast until it got ruined. It was moving super fast. Now it's, it's not moving at all. It's gone. Also, it caught on fire. That's the first time the train's caught on fire for me. <laughs> it's a lot of fire. I'm gonna start a forest fire with this thing. Okay, so you guys have seen the train crash into things that are going to destroy it, but I'm sure you guys would love to see the train destroy some other vehicles. Now, this is one of those things where I could probably do this for a whole video, and I probably will, but I want to give you guys a taste of what's to come. So we're going to do one or two crashes crashing the train into a normal car, and then we're probably going to have a whole separate video with more stuff like that, and just more kind of train nonsense in general. So if you guys have any specific ideas you would want to see with the train, Leave a comment so I know, and hopefully I'll be able to test it for the next train video. So I'm just going to park this car right here, and Super Deluxe Hyperspeed Train is going to just destroy them. I don't know how fast I should go. Maybe I'll try to go kind of a reasonable amount, like a little bit faster than the normal train can go. So like 80 miles per hour is probably good. 90 is fine even. Just a bit faster than normal. Now this one does have the snow plow attachment on front, so it should be able to really shove that car out of the way. Here we go. I'm going to use as much slow-mo as I possibly can here because I expect this to be swift destruction. Like the train is not even going to slow down. It has completely immobilized this car by breaking the drive shaft for it. And it's just going to keep pushing it along actually at this point. There's no rushing. It's just smashes into it. The car takes the impact and it gets shoved along and the train didn't even flinch. Like the train is so big and so heavy, it can crash into a car and not even notice. If we start accelerating this thing, it accelerates fine. That's what 10 billion horsepower does. <laughs> Nothing can slow you down. How about the brakes? How do they work though? They're actually working pretty well. I mean, we were moving and we're stopped already. That's mighty impressive braking there. And the funny thing is, I don't think it matters how many cars I put in front of this thing. Nothing was going to stop it. That's the damage to one single car. Quite a bit of damage. And yeah, it is not driving. So let's go ahead and try something bigger and heavier. We're going to go with a T-Series and we want it to be as heavy as possible. So the cement mixer comes into play for this. And then for the train, why don't we get a normal train on this one? I want to get one with a paint job you hopefully haven't seen before. So let's see... I don't think we've done the Santa Fe one, have we? No. So let's go ahead and do that one. The other one was something else in Santa Fe. This one's just Santa Fe. So we'll get it moving and then we'll go to the truck and see what happens. This should be a pretty good impact. Train looks like it's going about 40, 50 miles per hour. So we'll slow mo this thing. See what happens. This time I'm only using 16 times slow mo. I'm just letting the camera kind of do what it wants. The camera wants to go in this direction. So I say, okay, camera, go ahead and do that. And actually it is doing really, really well at absorbing the impact. Like the thing I'm noticing here is this isn't going to do much more damage than crashing the vehicle into a wall at the speeds that it's traveling. The thing is, is it just doesn't stop. Like it's so powerful. It shoves through the vehicle and it keeps going without flinching. That's the impressive part about that thing. It's just, we're going 75 miles per hour after just smashing into a, a big rig and there's almost no damage. Like I see a tiny bit of damage and we have a chain right there that's flinging about, okay? Normally that chain is attached to another metal piece. 
that's the only damage I see is that middle piece was damaged. And it was actually really cool that the chain can break like that. Like, I just like the fact that the chain bounces around, and not only does it do that, it can also break as well. So anyways, let's see what's up with the T-Series. Yeah, it's just been, it's been smashed really good, but it's no different than if you smashed into a brick wall going at those speeds. That's the only thing. Now, if we had two trains coming from both sides, unfortunately, we're going to have to try that in the next video because this video is already over a half hour long and I still have yet to talk about all of the different part options available for the train. So first off, let's take a look at the paint jobs. We have the plain paint job. Nothing really to talk about there. It's just basic, exactly like the text says. Be the BSSF, which you've already seen. The Onion Pacific, which you've already seen. Yeah, it says Onion Pacific. That threw me off for a second. The Santa Fe, which you've already seen. And then we got the Canada Atlantic, which is a new train you have yet to see. It looks like the flag on this thing is part Canada and part BMNG. I'm not gonna, well, I guess we could go and spawn up all the different trains so you can see the paint jobs. Why not? I wasn't planning on doing that, but you know what? What the heck? Actually, you can really see the details when you spawn it up. It looked like it was just kind of a flat red, but on this one you can see it's more of a weathered red. This thing has been through a lot of work and might need a new paint job soon. One of the funny things is none of the trains have graffiti on them. <laughs> Around me, if you see a train without graffiti, that's an oddity. Uh, next up, we got the Burlington Southern. So let's get that guy up and see what he looks like. You notice the numbers on the trains are always different. So this one, a little bit more plain. It just has that little logo right there, and that's about it. But again, it has some texture to it, and it's a different texture. Like, this one doesn't seem as worn down as the other one. The other one kind of was faded and stuff, but on this one, it's just a little dirty. Like, there are different textures depending on which paint job you have. So that's pretty cool. Uh, next up, we're going to go to the... You already saw the all the other ones. Oh, I almost missed it. The Eastern Pacific. Take a look at this one. Also, I don't know why, but you might have noticed whenever we spawn up a train, there's a little buzzing noise that happens. And I just, it's there. It's weird. This one has a red tip. And then Eastern Pacific on the side. This one's actually like a really, like, brutal looking train. I don't know why, but there's the paint job on this thing. It looks like brutalism to me. The architecture theme. Uh, anyways, next up we got, let's see here. It looks like the next one is going to be the blue one. And that one doesn't have any text on it. It's just kind of boring so let's skip over that one and we'll take a look at the beam rail one so this one's just a beam and g train here we are nothing too fancy here it just has a little logo there and the words beam rail on it does the front have a different color nope it's the same color as everything else but it does say beam rail there as well okay next up and this one might be getting close to the last i know there are 12 different paint jobs that i know of. I don't know if I'm going to cover all of them. Hopefully I do. If not, I apologize. Uh, next though, we got Chicago and Southwestern. Let's get this guy up and look at him. Nice little logo on it. Chicago and Southwestern line. All right. I like the paint job on this one. The yellow and green is pretty cool. Kind of uh, like the yellow and blue colors I like, except green is close to blue. It's not quite, but it's close. All right. Next up, we're going to be taking a look at... We could take a look at this one, but it looks like it's just a uh, flat red. I'll spawn it up real quickly to make sure I've been fooled before. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much just a flat red, nothing to really look at. Although this one, you can see this one has a fresh paint job. Like that thing is shining. None of the other ones were this clean. This is a brand new one, rolling out the factory, ready to train for millions and millions of miles. Yeah, you know, I wonder how many uh, miles do a train actually usually travel? Because you see such old trains all the time. And you must be thinking, you know, they're always moving. They must move a lot of miles, man. Anyways, next up, we're going to be taking a look at the rail sport version. See, it's a sporty train. It has like a sporty suspension set up and stuff and a wing and all that. It's like, this is ridiculous, but it's great. This is RS. And again, a very clean paint job on this one. It's nice and new. It says rail sport on the side over there. Very nice looking train right there. And I think the last one we're going to be taking a look at is the most ridiculous one. This is the multi-track drift. And yes, you can multi-track the train. Again, unfortunately, that's going to be have to save for the next video. But if you don't recognize what this paint job is inspired by, it is inspired by Initial D. It's just like the uh, Panda paint job on the AE86. It has the black bottom with the white and then the black stripe in the... I believe that's the same text that there is on the vehicle from Initial D. Uh, yeah, I'm about... 
99% certain that's the same text. You feel free to fact check me on that. But anyways, those are the paint jobs. Now let's take a look at the rest of the parts. And just in case, let's grab the other train. That way, if I need to do any comparison points, I'll have two trains side by side, although this one doesn't want to be on the tracks. Well, okay then, that's fine, I guess. I don't think we're going to drive you anymore. But that's kind of annoying. But anyways, for the paint design, you've already seen all those. I want to talk about the engine, though, because there's a lot of options for the engine. So first off, the engine is a 169.6 liter V16 diesel engine. 169.6 liter. Like, comparing that to car engines, that's just absurd. This engine is the size of a car. It is so big. For the long block, we have a bunch of options, and I, I never know, like, is a heavy duty block better than a stage one? Or what about an ultra heavy duty? Is that better than the stage one? Because they have similar options for the stock vehicles, and I never know. And then for engine management, we have a few options there. So we have ones that like limit the speed of the train because you don't want to flip it over and crash. And then you have ones that just say, yep, oh, nope, no limits. Go as fast as you want and crash if you want. We don't care, we're racing. And then we have a few turbocharger options and oh, okay. So the race version might've had superchargers on it. I'm, I think I called those turbochargers. They look like turbochargers, I thought though. Yeah, they kind of, they, they still look like turbochargers to me. They have that kind of shape. Oh, would you look at that though on the rear? You can see they are clearly belt driven. So yeah, that's a supercharger then. Okay. I just didn't notice that before. I just looked right here and it, you know, it has the kind of circular shape you usually see on a turbocharger. So I assume there's a turbocharger. But yeah, I love how they stick out like that. And there is a cut roof. So it's not just like going straight through the metal there. You just got to find the right piece to connect to it. If we grab the super fast version, it'll already have it equipped instead of me having to hunt it out. So let's just grab that real quick so you can see what it looked like. Here we go. On this one, you see a nice big gaping hole that allows the superchargers to breathe. And then the ridiculous exhaust. That, that's the exhaust right there. This one, it has a, a much more train-like exhaust. It doesn't have like flamethrowers all the time and stuff like that one does. And uh, that's pretty much, I think, most of the engine stuff. I think there's maybe one more part in the engine that I haven't talked about yet, and that's it. And let me do a quick double check. Oh, there's two, actually. First off, the transmission. There are four options here. There's also an 11-speed, which I think is used on the RS version. Then we have the one we were using most of the time, which was the dynamic brake run. There's also one that doesn't have the dynamic brakes. And then, of course, you have the race one, which is equipped right now to this one that's for racing. And then lastly, we have an auxiliary. No, this one doesn't have the piece I'm thinking of. That's what's throwing me off. Aha. I figured it out. At least I think this one should have the part I'm thinking of. So we're going to go to frame, engine, and then transmission, generator. And there we go. We have a bunch of different traction motor options. And I didn't even notice the other one didn't have traction motors, actually, because just I didn't until just now. And I don't think these are different visually. It's just performance based. So you can pick whichever one you want in terms of performance. But visually, that's just what they look like. They look like simple blocks. And uh, now let's talk about more of the visual differences. So some of the trains have really long noses. Some of them have really short noses. This is a long nose, 116 inches. Barely have any room in front of the train. But then we have ones like the 81 inch one, which is a little itty bitty nose. Lots of space in front of the train. And we have one in between, which is 88 inch, but it looks pretty close to the same as the 81 as far as I know. And now that I think about it, I have no idea what would be inside of the nose of a train. Just never thought about it until just now. Maybe there's some, I guess, maybe it's some sort of fuel tank because that looks like, looks like a fuel cap. I don't know. Just never thought about it until just now. Anyways, going over more of the visual differences. A lot of them are going to be under the long hood. And boy, is that hood long. Look at this thing. It's so long. Uh, that's just all one big giant piece. I think the first thing with alternative parts is going to be the air filter blower hatch because it has a antenna you could put on it. And it's just, it looks like it's slapped on. Like somebody's like, hey, wait, we need an antenna. All right, put it right here. It's not centered. I don't care. We slapped it on. That's good to go. It's blocking the exhaust. Don't care. Oh, it's actually not blocking the exhaust. That's the exhaust back there. I'm dumb. Uh, but yeah, it's just, I love how it looks like it's slapped on. And then next up, I think the equipment rack, we don't have any other options there for the radiator though. We do have a race performance radiator option, although I don't know if the visuals are different on that. I think it's just, yeah, it looks the same, but it performs better. Although we do have a few options on the look of the air intakes here. We have the corrugated ones. Then we have the race look, so it's like real big, and it lets a ton of air through it right there. Then we have one that's kind of in between. It's the wire grid one. Let's spawn that one up, and there you go. I like how it has double grid. It looks pretty cool like that. Kind of looks like it's reinforced, like almost like a prison maybe, but it looks cool. And then for the roof, we have a few other options here on this thing as well. Uh, let's see. Kind of get this whole thing into view just in case 
So right here on the dynamic brake roof, that is cooling for the dynamic brakes. But then we also have the cut one, which I think you saw earlier for the uh, turbocharger. Yeah, that's the exact same one. The supercharger, I'm still calling it a turbocharger. It's a supercharger. And then we also have the regular roof, which looks like the cut one, but without the hole. For the exhaust, you've already seen the race one. There's also a silencer exhaust, which is a little bit bigger, and I assume it'd be quieter. See, this one takes up about maybe almost double the space. For the radiator roof, we have a few options there as well, although I don't think these ones are visual. I think these ones are maybe, once again, performance-based. So I know we have a few different options for the fans, but I don't know if they look different. So we're going to go from the regular ones to the race fans and keep your eyes steady. See if you see a difference here. Uh, to me, they look the same, so I think it's just a performance-based difference. We also have the winterization hatch, which covers up the first fan right there and protects it a little bit. Here we are. And that covers the majority of the options. There are some different options with like different lights and antennas and all kinds of stuff all around the front and the horns. Those are kind of minor though, so I'm not going to really bother going over them. I do want to mention though that you can have a little light on top and you can also have a bell, which although not equipped, it'll still work. It looks like this train, I don't think it has a bell on it, but if you hit the bell button, it works. And now that I think about it, I never let you guys actually hear what the train sounds like. We got to do that real quickly, don't we? So let's grab a regular train to drive around just because I don't know if the RS will kind of sound a little funky or not. I never paid that close of attention to the sounds. Now we got a normal one so you can listen to what it sounds like if it was on the tracks, which it's not. So let me clean everything up, get the train on the tracks, and we'll be good to go. I realize the easiest solution is just to reload the map. And this is going to be the end of the video. Don't forget to leave comments if there's anything you want to see the train do in the next part for this video. But until then, this has been YBR, and remember, if you like or dislike this video, I will know. I can tell by looking at the grooves in the train tracks. So do the right thing, and I'll see you next time. And I hope you enjoy listening to the train.